what we're going. Um, guys, this is the narrative uh, section, but um, before we started, I, I wanted to do a coda to the last uh, panel. Um, one of our panelists today is uh, is Jim Miller, and a couple of us on the panel, I think three of us, actually belong to a church in Corpus called uh, All Saints Episcopal. And Jim, how, how long ago was your blessing? Was it about five, six years ago? It was, yeah. yeah, it was 2014 was when we got married, so it was like 2000, I think it was 2015 when we had a blessing ceremony. And uh, we, we had gotten permission to um, to be the first uh, church in one of three churches in the Western Texas Diocese to do blessings of same-sex unions. And at that um, ceremony, two couples who had been together for almost 70 years um, were, uh, unions were blessed. And one of the ladies, Judy Loverly, asked me to write a poem for the occasion. So I, I wasn't planning on this, but as I was sitting there, I, I really, it's a short poem. And it goes, uh, why we are here, the blessing and the blessed, for Jim and Joe, Judy and Vicki. Before they were born, there was the one word, and the word was both noun and verb, love. And love put a deposit down and flipped the cosmic switch, and then there was light. The great glow of love that still shines, unhinted, uh, unhidden, unfiltered, to all those who seek it. And it illuminated our friend's path that merged into greater lights, beacons that led us all to this grace-filled moment the celebration of the blessing and the blessed. And now on to the narrative. So I, I saw Nathan here a, a second ago. I, a few years ago, many years ago, Nathan and I were encouraged both to uh, uh, send manuscripts to a, a, a publisher who will rename nameless and uh, the rejection came back there was a panel and everybody on the panel had to uh, say that they wanted to uh, agree to publish the book and one guy on the panel on both of our submissions wrote there is no such thing as narrative poetry only failed prose and as I was sitting here today uh, I, and listening to the poems and the different sections, and even last night, I would say at least 80% of all the poems I've heard so far are narrative in nature. And even the lyric poetry, there's a camera. The, the, the narrator is a camera, and that camera moves. And in that movement is a story. And so, um, this is uh, an unabashable uh, uh, getting some friends together to, to read you some narrative poems. I'm not going to read a lot. Um, and as I was thinking about this, we're a narrative panel, but I, we, we could also be a Martian panel because um, Paul and me and Sarah and Michael have all worked at uh, one time, and a lot of us still work there now, uh, uh, at Del Mar College. And Jim is just from Mars, so um, a lot of people don't know that about Jim. Um, so, but I guess we'll stick with the narrative. And it really upsets me sometimes, too, that some of our finest poets who are narrative uh, get ditched dissed for being narrative poets. For example, it's very common when you look at the criticism about B.H. Fairchild, who's one of my favorite poets, uh, he is constantly called a gateway poet. Like, you, you, 
like, you know, you, you read B.H. Fairchild because he tells stories, and, and then you can move on to the harder stuff. Um, it makes no sense. Uh, so I'm going to start with a poem called In the Defense of Narrative. I wrote a creative thesis many years ago at the University of North Texas with a man named Rick Sale who happened to grow up in Odom, uh, which is a little town just north of here. And, uh, and I had no idea I would end up in Corpus Christi someday and know where Odom was. Um, and one night, while getting drunk with Rick in, the, uh, in a place called the Flying Tomato in Denton, Texas, um, which is one of the loudest places ever, we got in an argument, Rick and I, not together, but with two images. And, and we happened to have this argument while playing pinball. And we got thrown out of the place for making too much noise. <laughs> Rick always said it was one of his favorite accomplishments of his academic career, getting kicked out of the flying tomato for making too much noise. So here's the poem in the defense of the narrative for Rick Sale. Slipping past the desk at times, you know what? Tom, you don't have to move the thing, Tom. Don't worry. Where the hell? Can I borrow your biographies? Oh, no, I got them. I'm so well prepared. I forgot everybody's biography. We'll start over again. I'll <laughs> edit that up, I'm sure. Uh, there's a 30 second or two minute lag on that Facebook Live stuff, right? Um, <laughs> In defense of the narrative for Rick Sale, slipping past the desk at times, he would stand in our beer-filled places, a welcome guest, a fugitive from ordered space. He volunteered for battle in our war and fought well at my side that one night when two imagists argued that good poetry did not tell a story but created visions that intrigued more than men. They held their own through the first few downed pitchers, but when we moved to the pinball machine to defend our Miss Bishop, we humbled them. With each shot, they evoked Pong, swore in Chinese, sweated faces in the station metro. But how could they win? Piling up the bells and flashes, not the points, not knowing the trick to scoring well, was putting the shots together to clean a rack, earning the bonus, ignoring the lights, and playing the game. First up is, if I can find it, Q comes before S, doesn't it? Uh, Michael Quintana. Michael received his MFA in creative writing from San Jose State University. He's the founder of Script Journey, a script and story consult consultation service that helps writers develop their written projects. His fiction has appeared in the Winterick Review, and his poetry has appeared in Strike Magazine. He's won various awards for screenwriting, including the CSU Media Arts Festival Rosebud Award in 2005, his award-winning short script, The Blind Date, was turned into a short film. Currently, he serves as a distinguished reader for the Cinequest Film Festival, teaches composition at Del Mar College, and is a pop culture writer for Zimbio. You can learn more about Script Journey by visiting www.scriptjourney.com. Michael, please. So I tend to dabble in a lot of different genres, poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction, and uh, screenwriting. And it's always interesting to try to think of what constitutes a poem and why we choose to use uh, that form for this storytelling. Especially when it comes to narrative, it's like it could be a short story, but why does it fit better as a poem? And so when I think of narrative poetry, I think of the sound. 
I want to do something with sound. I wanted to feel a little dreamy. And I want to just sit a little bit above the page. So I'm going to open with um, a smaller poem. It's called The Lot. And in this poem, it just feels like a flash. And we just follow a voice. Okay. The Lot. Remember when you asked about the fire, about the things I saw seeped in smoke and the things I knew weren't there? About the way the wind blew, spraying so loud, I told you I thought about July and red raw summer heat. Times when I scraped my knees and licked them, tasting the tangy blare of alkaline batteries. Away it went from me. And sometimes I pass by everything, or what I think is everything, and let myself imagine parts of me invested in a bird's nest, some flake like old skin housed between twigs. And that's the long one. And so in everything I write, when it comes to poetry here, um, narratives, I always try to take a little piece of truth and then turn it like a grain of sand becoming a pearl. So I always embed something that's real and then I keep weaving and turning and weaving and turning. And what's really interesting about this next poem I'm going to read, it's called The Stir, is um, <clears throat> it's based on fact. A lot of it's based on fact, right? Inspired by reality, but it's, um, time's a little bit more collapsed than this one. And we're playing with different things. So. It's the stir. We just left the long, low road. The long, low road purring beneath our feet, somewhere between roads at an intersection. We were going home together. We'd seen your breast, inky black, and housing a constellation of stars, or something like them. And yet, you later confess. That's not what made you feel most vulnerable. Our conversation escaped us. It reached for sunrise, and I let this worry roll over me like ocean water waves, praying for the best. I've been here before, created. It felt something like death. Let's get high. We sneak out to the backyard and you asked me if I'd ever thought I'd see myself here. And I know that question is more yours than my own. At 28, you had me. At 28, I had a house, a boyfriend, a puppy, and still you. Those stars scooped out in spaces only you remember to remember. Both of us still returning to Saturn. And that's the core that binds us the strongest. That 28 twice is 56. And as you're coming, I'm going. You tell me I have changed, that my puppy has imbued me with the maternal instinct, the kind you have for me. And I believe it, knowing that I, at least, never have to set him wild. I close my eyes and tell you that I want a tattoo. I want a tattoo I only vaguely remember wanting in my youth. I thought, of it, I thought about it randomly while working out at the gym, dusted it off, and have held on to it ever since. It's a lyric from one of Gwen Stefani's songs. It says, born a blossom, bloom to perish. I continue to tell you I haven't thought about this tattoo in years, but I've decided that I want it, that I really want it. This tattoo scrawled down the side of my left flank in a legible enough scrawl that makes, and this makes you laugh. You laugh and you call me crazy. You laugh again and say, why not go ahead, it's your body. And suddenly I recognize something in you, your ability to now understand your body as something you simply wear. Now I don't want to tell you my why not, my reason for not getting a tattoo. Now I've started laughing. I laugh so hard it forces me to stand up. Now I've started coughing. I finally calm. You demand I tell you, okay, okay, fine. 
I really want a tattoo, but I'm afraid of its permanence. I sit back down and we both laugh, letting the smoke carry our laughter up to the heavenly bodies still hanging above us. This is another one. This is a smaller poem. It's called Chords. And it's so interesting, when I was looking for pieces to read, a lot of the stuff I've written has to do with relationships that turn. And this is another one that has to do with my mother. It's this understanding that as she ages, I'm aging as well, but I'm going in, down a different road than she went. So when she tells me stories of her youth, I was like, wow, that was not my case at all. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, and it's just this understanding that at, sometimes we intersect as we age, and there are moments that we both share that keeps us connected, like the times when we fell in love or our misadventures. Uh, this is Quartz. Yesterday, it sat on the tip of my tongue with the texture of fuzz, the underbelly of a thin skinned leaf. I first heard it when I touched my mother's shoulder. In the space between seconds, in the space no longer between us, I felt her love story completely. <laughs> this, this poem is for Nathan Brown. Uh, I've never gotten to thank him for this in public. I thank him privately. A few years ago, um, TWU was doing a thing where they uh, were, they had a podcast where they got poet laureates, uh, state poet laureates, Nathan was Oklahoma's, um, to uh, read their poems and pick somebody else's poem and talk about it. And Nathan was kind enough to pick this poem. So thank you, Nathan. Uh, the poem's called Temperance. And this is just to show you that you, narrative poems do not have to be long. Uh, each year come Ash, Ash Wednesday, my father swore off the sauce. Cold turkey for 40 days and 40 nights of self-willed sobriety. Our family life slid slowly off its hard edge. Each night my parents watched over my bedside Lenten prayers. Finished, I'd climb into bed and fall asleep, counting down the days until Jesus would rise from the tomb and the bottle would descend from the unlocked cupboard. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are. thing I'd ever read. <laughs> and everybody thinks it's so sad. I don't know. Uh, sad. <laughs> um, Sarah Lentz, uh, Lentz's writing, has appeared in Crazy Horse, Colorado Review, the Fourth River Entropy, South Dakota Review, Santa Ana Review, Crab Orchard Review, Woo! Front Porch, and elsewhere. You know, by the way, if you ever start a journal, guys, young, young folks, if you ever start a journal, <laughs> name it and elsewhere. And then everybody will think that they've been published in your journal, and everybody will go, wow, what a great journal. Um, <laughs> just saying, sorry, Sarah. Um, three of her essays have been named Notable and Best American Essay, she received the New Letter, uh, Letters Readers Award in Nonfiction. She holds an MFA in Creative Nonfiction from Georgia College and an MA from Boise State University and a BFA in Fiction from the University of Nebraska, Omaha. She's the founder of the Writers Studios Corpus Christi where she's doing amazing work with Michael. Uh, you can find more information at writersstudio.org which offers free classes on creative writing craft. Sarah also serves as a pro editor for the Switchgrass Review. She teaches composition and creative writing 
in literature at Del Mar College. And although she swears she's not a poet, she's a champ and she's here to help us out. <laughs>
remember the dead, we also have to tell their story. Um, and that's a great way to keep their memory alive. Um, so that's kind of my elegies or stories or narratives um, in a way. The first one is called Elegy for Henry. And I should let you know that Henry was not human. He was a house cat. He was a rather obese tabby who um, died much too young from complications of feline diabetes. So this is Elegy for Henry. When we brought you home for the last time, you were curled cold, a furred tiger mollusk. Striped spiral tail, a parenthetical, a mercurial whirl, but no longer capricious. From purr to growl, no more fickle tricks with presto changeo claws. I remember the night Kent was admitted with kidney stones, and you were just a kitten small enough to hold in one hand, curved like a glass bean. Any living thing can be a comfort creature. <clears throat> we buried you under the spirea bush, and in the same hazy October morning, tore out 20 tomato vines among withered leaves, sun-rotted fruit, clung loose with seeds. We wanted the plants gone before killing frost because seeing them blackened in death was more than we could bear. And this is called Chili's Elegy. Starting in 2016, Brinker Inc. overhauled the decor in all 839 of its Chili's stores. They took the tiled tables, bright, Mexican, and replaced them with something resembling reclaimed wood, branded and scarred. But you wouldn't know that, would you? Dying like you did at 48. How you pickled your liver with clever, fast, casual efficiency. A talent you had along with denial and working a six table section without breaking a sweat. I never told you that I hated being drunk that first time after my inaugural margarita at the Chili's on 72nd and Dodge. I skewed like a fountain on all those Talavera tiles. <laughs> <laughs> Always pretending I could be what you wanted me to be. I miss you like chips and salsa mixed with ranch. Remember all those shifts we opened together, your serotip surreptitious screwdriver in a plastic kitty cup. And now, years after your death, I still love the humongous red pepper neon beacon beaming from interstates the country over, proclaiming the message, we're not unique. Your sad alcoholic story is not, as the slogan says, like nowhere else. <laughs> Amy, and she 
she's the only person that I know that was born um, on a leap year on February 29th, so um, she gets to celebrate her birthday uh, this year. <laughs> so this seems a fitting poem. Unseen foxes. I didn't believe in power animals until you told me yours was a fox. I'd never glanced the flash of burnt umber fur, real life flesh, until I met you at the convent where you lived with geriatric nuns. But you were neither Catholic or old, just a young woman trying to find her way against the darkness. That gray afternoon, we saw a fox as we walked through the cemetery and talked about how to pray without words. Frightened, the fox ran to her den, an earth mound like an Indian burial ground. Last week at dawn, you picked me up in your minivan on the way to Susan's sunrise yoga class. We felt fragile because the oceans are rising, the forests burning, <laughs> and children are being put in cages. We each had a thermos coffee clasped tight against the morning when on Irwin Street we turned to see the streak in magnificent fox on spindle nimble feet. Another really short narrative. Uh, a, a minimal love sonnet, a sonnet of 14 words. He said, the bed, her eyes surprised, flashed, feminine wrath, passion refused, he boozed. Uh, <laughs> they don't have to be long. <laughs> um, our first People's Poetry Festival, uh, I invited Paul McCann to come read, and uh, right after, uh, or right, I think like the week of uh, of the festival, uh, his father passed away. And being the terrible person I am, I didn't remember to reinvite him to this year, so I apologize. <laughs> um, Paul McCann is currently a professor of composition and creative writing at Del Mar College. He, uh, recently was awarded the George Nixon Award for the Best Fiction at the 2008 Conference of English Teachers of English in Kingsville. He has been published in several journals, including Argestes, Argestes? Argestes. Thank you, sir. Bayou and the Berkeley Poetry Review. His first collection, When the Wood is Green, was published in 2014 by Slow Press. Is there or is it slow? Slow? Slow, slow? okay. Paul, you have hard words. Sorry. <laughs> uh, earlier in his career, he focused on literary scholarship. His years of study on the subject culminated in the publication of a 2008 book, Race, Music, and National Identity by Fairleigh Dickinson University Press. He now lives in Rockport, Texas with his wife, Tolly, and their two children, Pepper and Skelly. Welcome, Paul. Well, thanks for not inviting me. No. <laughs> um, you know, I want to thank everybody who organized this as well. and. Uh, I kind of had the opposite experience in that uh, having a son did completely subsume my writing identity. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, um, yeah, I used to really look forward to this sort of thing, whatever a conference or a chance to speak and meet with, with writers and Corpus Christi would come around, I would jump at the chance and um, then decided to have kids. Uh, uh, and I'm actually going to start with a poem about that. Um, but it did kind of take over my life, and now that they're getting a little older, it's a little easier to step out uh, than it used to be. But the first poem I want to read, um, and it, you know, I say that, but at the same time, I, I admit the same thing: that is, there was something that really inspired me creatively about having a child. And uh, um, my son, in particular, uh, suffers from or, or is on the autism spectrum disorder. And um, this first poem is about the, the day that I figured that out. 
you know, uh, or realized it or accepted it as true, I guess I should say. It's titled Focalin, which is a type of ADHD medication. At five, he's clever enough to work his tongue around the pill, slither and slide so the ice cream slips down his throat, but the pill remains delicate, delicately between his baby teeth tucked. Eyes averted, he seems cagey, defiant as I slide my arm around his torso, my hand over his mouth, kicking, pulling, pushing at father's firmness calm. The thrashing reminds me of his first attempts to swim. First week of summer at the community pool, he could not sit still to blow bubbles, feckless from the mouths of more fearful kids, contained to the steps and safe shallows. Look at the baby, some scream, and it's true, even at three, he has a diaper. He understands, but as usual, he ignores. A losing bout for the old man, from the shallows to the deep and back, I drew him to the minnows of his class, pleading for his conformity, only to lose him again. I give the instructor an apologetic shrug. He's fine, she replies. No fear, that's good. But is it? I'm afraid that he won't find his stroke, that he'll plunge into everything, that he will drown in any comforting envelopment. Finally, he is flashing free as the water spreads diamonds in the morning sun. Army crawls at first, and he leads finally with his back with awkward native strokes like an otter finding his way around the instructors. I can only comment, a good swimmer, just a bad student. The instructor reassures me with nods and smiles. He has learned the lesson after all. No assurances now. No watery escapes in the big blue, just the slapping of father flesh and labored breathing until the pill finally finds the only available exit so that we can embrace like weary boxers, punch drunk, head to head, trying to conceive a more elegant mind. In 1905, an American author by the name of Samuel Langhorpe Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, wrote a prose poem called The War Prayer. And I was one of the countless wars that America's in, and I can't remember which one it's been. We've been in so many of late. But anyway, we were, we were supposed to write a poem about disagreeing with the idea of being in the war, uh, being, being against war as a general. So this was my contribution. I call it poverty. Man is the only creature, so far as the subject is known, that having an insufficiency of disasters is moved to create his own. Some speculate it must be hate. Still others point to pride or greed. But let me state to close debate, it is nothing more than need. For we have not enough orphans. We have not enough dead. There are not enough cripples, not enough wounded and bled. We have too few young widows, too few veterans, halt and lame, we need more shrapnel wounded that men might tell the weather's change. There are not enough craters scarring once fertile fields, we need rows and rows of crosses, mighty heaven heed our appeal. We require more generals, but briefer. Let us undertake to thin the ranks. We should develop larger missiles. We should spend more money on tanks. We stand in poverty of men with nightmares. We require more bloody paths to fame. A nation should have more crutches, more graves without names. We need more monuments to war. A nation should have more shame. Can we make a request? Sure. Well, can you read gravy? Can you read your gravy poem? Can you have your gravy poem with you? I don't have the gravy poem. I do have cycle chefs and paranoid potatoes. <laughs> Cycle 
little chefs and paranoid potatoes. <laughs> Silence of the yams. <laughs> Are potatoes paranoid, hiding there beneath the soil, sending out trailing vines, watching with a hundred eyes, burrowing in dark root cellar, huddling in a gunny sack, listening for creaking steps, misery of cold and damp? You'd think we were going to skin them alive. Boil them in oil or cut out their eyes. <laughs> Come on up, little fella. Have a warm bath waiting in salted water. Maybe even a pat of butter and a little dash of pepper. <laughs>